you uh, all for this invitation. Uh, MIT is one of my favorite places. Uh, when I was in law school over at Harvard, I used to study here because I had a day job and I didn't get ready to study until about 9 o'clock at night and this was the only place that had a library open all night. Um, at Harvard they went to sleep uh, and here they never did so I spent actually more time at MIT than you would think. Um, and I, I love the place because up until relatively recently uh, it was a place where, where you represented a student or a faculty member in a disciplinary matter. It actually proceeded along rational lines uh, and I always thought that was wonderful. That, of course, is changing now as the student life bureaucracy is exploding and the place is being run by lawyers rather than by uh, deans. Uh, but nonetheless, it remains a step ahead of most places. So I'm very pleased to have uh, the end. You know, I've represented quite a few people, actually, uh, mostly students in trouble uh, here at, uh, at MIT. And I'm particularly delighted when I got here and saw that we were at the British Consulate's building and that I was going to give a lecture for the first time in my life before the great seal of Henry VIII, uh, whose motto uh, is emblazoned right in front of me, uh, Dieu et mon droit, God in my right hand, uh, which of course was how he uh, ruled England. Actually, he had it reversed. It was really his right hand first and God second. Um, but uh, this is the first time that I have given a lecture unto the a banner of the Henry VIII's uh, motto, so I'm feeling uh, particularly uh, titillated uh, by, this, uh, by this opportunity. But my subject is a very serious one, especially for folks like most of the people in this room who are uh, in the life sciences or medical devices field, because uh, the, that field in particular has become a minefield um, with regard to regulation and prosecution by uh, the Food and Drug Administration and the uh, Department uh, of Justice. It has become an extraordinarily dangerous environment uh, that you really can't leave until they come knocking at your door. And I uh, finally came, got down about uh, seven years ago to starting to write a, a long gestating book, which I called Three Felonies a Day, How the Feds Target the Innocent. Um, the, uh, the title isn't, isn't too obscure, I think. Uh, the notion is that every uh, busy, active person in civil society uh, gets up in the morning, goes about his or her day's work, uh, goes home, uh, says goodnight to the kids, has dinner, maybe watches the news on television or reads uh, or sends out a few thousand email, and uh, then uh, uh, should realize, but usually doesn't, that in the course of that busy day, he or she probably committed three arguable federal felonies. And uh, that's the startling realization. Uh, I'm Maybe three is a little hyperbolic, but certainly two. Uh, but uh, it's a very dangerous world, and it shouldn't be, and it needn't be. Uh, but I wrote the book to give people an idea of how they can protect themselves, what they have to look out for, and also hoping to organize various lobbying groups within civil society to try to get uh, regulatory agencies in the Congress to repeal some of these, mon these legal monstrosities that have uh, built up uh, since about uh, the mid 80s. Now, I start out the talk uh, by I have to explain one legal concept to you, and that's the concept that you've heard about but may not really know what it means in practice due process of law guaranteed. Uh, by the, in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments of, of the uh, Constitution. Uh, and that means a lot of things, but I'll give you an example of how important it is. Some of you were old enough to remember the old bad Soviet Union, uh, and uh, the Soviet legal code was really an exemplar of this tactic of enacting extremely vague criminal statutes that nobody could really understand, but that you could squeeze the activity of disfavored people into that statute when you decided it was time to get them off the streets 
for whatever reason that you, you had to do so. Um, for example, uh, hooliganism, the Soviet uh, crime, which was um, used uh, against uh, Jewish refuseniks. Uh, they were deemed hooligans, and they, were, uh, they served long stretches in the gulag because they were convicted of uh, hooliganism. Why was it so many were convicted? Well, there was no defense. Why was there no defense? Because there was no definition. And so uh, you really couldn't win a Soviet trial where the charge was uh, hooliganism. Uh, Stalin, uh, the, uh, the infamous uh, uh, dictator, would uh, tell his uh, chief of police, uh, secret police, a barrier, uh, that he wanted to get rid of somebody, and uh, it could be done all according to the law. You would pick up somebody in charge with hooliganism, and before you know it, he was in Siberia. Well, uh, we laugh about this uh, of course, it's been the laughing stock of the legal world for a long time. Even the Soviets finally got rid of it. Uh, well, actually, it's debatable how much they've gotten rid of uh, under the new Russian uh, uh, legal system. Uh, but um, in fact, the concept is very much alive and well in 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 this country, uh, and we have a lot of uh, statutes that are the legal equivalent of the Soviet hooliganism a statute. And uh, this is of particular concern, I know, to people who uh, graduated MIT are in, and are in uh, fields of endeavor where they're innovators, or where they're entrepreneurs, uh, especially, and I'll get to this a little bit later in a part of my talk that will surprise you, uh, maybe scare you a little bit, uh, and that is people who are innovators are particularly susceptible to the kinds of prosecutions and harassment that I'm about to describe for two reasons. Number one, the government doesn't understand what they're doing. Trust me. I have been doing this work since I got into the bar in 1967, and I can assure you the government doesn't really have much of an understanding of what most of the people in this room do. And uh, they also are unduly afraid of new things. And the combination of the fact that, uh, uh, that many of you are innovators, um, entrepreneurs, uh, you also upset some of the established order. Remember, one of the things about being a pioneer is that you upset the people who have a stake in the status quo. And I have represented quite a few people whose major crime was that they upset the big bank in town because they figured out a financing uh, a system that bypassed the need to borrow money from banks, or they were developing a mode of doing business that was going to put a lot of other people out of business um, and was going to sort of shake up uh, the uh, the, the, uh, the business scene, or the science scene, uh, the techno scene, uh, and the people who are pioneers are particularly vulnerable to the kinds of prosecutions and harassment that I am about to um, explain. I'm going to begin with a case, uh, I'm going to talk about a few cases uh, that will give you a rounded picture of of how ubiquitous uh, and how malleable uh, the feds are when it comes to going after people. For one reason or another, they don't like or they consider to be fraud artists because they don't understand what they're doing. Um, I'm going to talk about Michael Milken. Many of you have heard, uh, a few of you might not have heard of Michael Milken. Uh, uh, he uh, uh, he was the uh, upstart in the finance world back in the 80s, and uh, he was uh, the major moneymaker for a then uh, bustling brokerage firm uh, called Drexel Burnham Lambert. And in the 1990s, they really came of age. Uh, they had uh, figured out how to finance new upstart enterprises with bypassing the big banks, bypassing Wall Street, 
bypassing the stock exchanges, bypassing all of the usual powers that be that had a grip, a virtual monopoly on the financing of enterprises. If they didn't want to fund you, you didn't get funded. Um, uh, so Milken enabled a number of uh, entrepreneurs to get started uh, and to really challenge the status quo in a very fundamental way, uh, uh, including various deeply entrenched monopolies. For example, he financed Ted Turner's creation of cable news network. See, that may be an old story to you now, but believe me, back when Milken uh, got them financing, it was uh, they were really the upstarts. McCaw Cellular uh, was a Milken financed uh, a company. Barnes and Noble. And now, Barnes and Noble, of course, is running second, third, or fourth fiddle to Amazon. But back then, the idea of such huge bookstores was a big threat to publishers. It was a big threat to independent booksellers. Uh, and uh, MCI, another communications company. So. Uh, uh, Milken earned the enmity of a lot of people, including uh, Wall Street and the big banks uh, and big brokerage firms. Well, uh, he came to the attention of the government partly because he was earning so much money, the feds figured nobody could earn. One, one year he earned over half a billion dollars just that you know mind you this is from you know working every day and now people uh, earn a, a billion dollars in, uh, in a single trade um, but back then he actually had to work for it and Milken really worked for it and he earned huge amounts of money and um, the feds figured well he must be a crook if you can't earn that much uh, honestly and um, they finally, they investigated him very uh, closely, uh, and they finally indicted him uh, in a vast, sprawling indictment that sought not only to put him in prison forever, but also to confiscate the money that he had made, uh, as, as the government said, by a racketeering enterprise. And uh, Milken was well defended in the beginning. He was defended by the legendary Edward Bennett Williams, whom some of you might remember of blessed memory, of one of the greatest trial lawyers the country has ever known. And Ed, Ed, Ed Williams died of cancer just as the Milken indictment was coming. And Milken then was represented by, uh, uh, shall we say, Wall Street lawyers. Um, uh, after that, uh, Arthur Lyman uh, was his chief counsel. Uh, he never had another lawyer uh, like Ed Williams uh, uh, prior to his, at the time of his trial. And, um, but uh, I'm not blaming, by the way, Milken's legal team. I'm just pointing out, I, think, I do think history might have changed if Ed Williams had not died. Um, but uh, the indictment was a remarkable document. It went and described various deals where Milken had financed uh, some of these uh, um, uh, groundbreaking, uh, innovative companies. And the way the prosecutors described the deals, it made them sound like, you know, rackets, because they didn't understand the financing mechanism. They didn't even understand the industries uh, that Milken was, was financing. And there was a huge, sprawling indictment that asked for a, a billion dollar forfeiture of Milken's money. Uh, and they, they actually got the court to freeze one billion dollars of Milken's money prior to uh, the, uh, the time the indictment uh, was, came out. Now, they did that. That's very common, by the way. You, you find uh, that people who are indicted, especially businessmen, indicted by the feds, the feds come up with some theory that they're going to owe money, you know, at the end of the case, if convicted, their assets should be frozen so that the government can collect at the end of the case. And, of course, what the real purpose of the freezing of assets is, is to prevent you from being able to pay for your defense, your legal counsel. So that's like the first trick that they use, the first dirty trick that they use uh, after an indictment is returned. They try to get use that you can't afford uh, to defend yourself.
government puts unlimited funds into trying to prosecute you, and you're supposed to uh, defend yourself without access to your money. Fortunately, after they froze Milken's billion, fortunately he had a second billion that he was able to devote to his defense. So, which he did. But uh, the and he was prepared to fight uh, because he knew and all the people uh, who, who were on his, his camp knew that he had done not one thing illegal. He had to survive the most microscopic investigation by the SEC, the Department of Justice, and they couldn't come up with anything that he really did that was criminal. But instead, they fashioned an indictment that portrayed his perfectly lawful actions as violations of securities fraud, mail fraud statutes. They were able to do that because by that time there was no definition of what for fraud was anything that a prosecutor decided he didn't like. And that was as, as, as fine as the definitions were. And yet he still fought. However, the government had one secret well, they indicted Michael's brother Lowell, his kid brother, his younger brother, who worked for the firm and who uh, offered some legal advice. He was a lawyer, offered some legal advice. He wasn't really terribly active. He was the kid brother and had a decent job, made a decent living. Um, but um, uh, he really had very little to do with Michael's investment uh, 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 investment activities, but he got indicted anyway as a conspirator with his older brother. The reason for the indictment, if you look at the indictment carefully, you could see this. Why in the world, you say, because it was the younger brother, he hardly did anything um, uh, in connection with the, with the, with the financing uh, uh, structures. Uh, why was he indicted? Well, the cynical answer was, was learned by how the case ended up. Michael decided he was going to plead guilty rather than go to trial, even though his legal team, even with, in the absence of Edward Bennett Williams, was prepared to try the case, uh, because the government made him an offer. Then those of you who, uh, who, who like to watch uh, Godfather movies will understand the jargon here. The government made him an offer that he could not refuse. They said that if he pleaded guilty, they would dismiss the indictment against Lowell. Now, I have a word for that. Uh, I call it uh, extortion. I call it hostage taking. The government calls it a perfectly okay, a perfectly legal device, which of course, if a defense lawyer used it, that'd be indicted for obstruction of justice. But when a prosecutor uses it, it's just par for the course. Michael pleaded guilty, and you can take this from me, um, and if you don't believe me, uh, I guess you just don't believe me, because I don't think that Michael himself is ever going to open up and talk about this painful era, aspect of his life, but I can tell you he's given me permission to write about it and talk about it, uh, but he will not. Uh, but you can take it from me that he pleaded guilty for one reason and one reason alone, and that was to rescue his brother. Now, any legal system that is so corrupt that it has to depend on the hostage taking of a younger brother in order to force an older brother to plead guilty because the government's nervous that their theories might not hold up if, if they go to trial is a legal system in need of a certain amount of reform uh, to put it uh, as politely as I can. I'm, I happen to feel very strongly about this because I was hired with Alan Dershowitz of the Harvard Law School after um, Michael pleaded guilty and got an unexpectedly harsh 10-year sentence. He wanted us to look at whether or not the, the circumstances of this plea, and we read the record and we could not believe that, that a, a, a man whom we could not figure out what crime he possibly committed, not only was serving 10 years, but had pleaded guilty in order to save his brother from equally specious indictment. And uh, in the end, Michael decided that uh, he was going to move for a sentence reduction rather than move to vacate the plea, and he did get a sentence reduction. By then, even the judge understood that he hadn't committed a crime. It, she reduced the sentence to uh, two years, and he was out a couple of months later. Now, um, 
for those of you who remain skeptical that I'm perhaps overstating my case when I say that Michael did not commit a single crime uh, in, in that indictment or any crime that we could see, um, even that was outside of the indictment, tell you that a fellow named Alan Rosenthal, and this is in my book, you could look in the index under Rosenthal, and you'll see the case described. He went to trial on one of the counts. He was a co-defendant with Milken. He, was, he went to trial and with regard to one of the six deals that were, that were featured in the Milken indictment. And the judge heard the government's presentation, a fellow named Stanton, who sits on the bench in the Southern District of New York, and uh, Stanton uh, acquitted him before even requiring the defense to put on a case because Stanton said, I've heard everything the government said. This deal that the Rosenthal is accused of being in, uh, conspiring with Milken on is not a crime. It is an ordinary, or maybe it's an extraordinary business deal, uh, but it is not fraud. And he acquitted uh, Rosenthal. And um, that confirmed uh, what Dershowitz in my advice to Michael, that he indeed had not committed a crime, and if he wanted to attack his uh, plea of guilty, he could. As I said, he decided uh, not, to, not to do that. The case is described in more detail, and I've written about it, by the way, in a book <laughs> called Payback, uh, written by Professor Daniel Fischel of the University of Chicago, who's written a brilliant book about the, 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 the whole Milton, uh, Milken um, uh, career. Now, so that's, that's one case. Uh, and as I said, it, it, it was directed at an innovator, uh, in this case, a financial innovator. Um, let me tell you about another one that's a little bit more local, a little bit more closer to home. A case of a fellow named Brad Councilman who worked for a company called Interlock Inc. out in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Uh, they had developed an online uh, listing for rare uh, and out of print books. And uh, they had a number of customers who were either collectors of books or who were dealers um, of rare books. And Interlock uh, developed sort of a, a, became an ISP. They developed uh, interlock.com, and if you were a customer of theirs, you could use the interlock system for your email. And um, uh, uh, Councilman was indicted because one of the things that he did in his employment of, for interlock was when an email came in to the interlock computers, uh, he would make a backup copy of them, and then they would be resent out with the interlock.com uh, 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 suffix, uh, uh, and they would be then reshipped out to wherever they were going. There was a lot of traffic in particular between Interlock's customers and book dealers like Amazon uh, and rare book, rare book dealers. Uh, and uh, he was indicted, Brad Councilman was, for making this backup copy because the feds claimed that it was a violation of the wiretap statute that he made this copy of the email as it was passing through Interlock's system. And uh, this was handled by my law firm, and a uh, councilman was uh, uh, moved to dismiss the indictment on the ground that what he was doing uh, was not a violation of the, of the wiretap statute. It was a gross abuse of the wiretap statute to interpret it that way. Um, but that's how the Department of Justice interpreted it. Uh, and it was a big case. They sent prosecutors up from Washington to help the local office uh, prosecute this case. Uh, and um, uh, we moved to dismiss the indictment on a rather technical ground. And the ground was that since the emails were in Interlock's computer at the time Brad made the copy, he was not making a copy of a message as it was going through the wires, which is how the wiretap statute defines wiretapping, but rather it was, for a very brief period of time, it was stopped, it was copied, and then it was sent on. And, you know, if they wanted to abuse the statute, 
with their interpretation, we figured we would be a little bit light-handed ourselves with the, with, the, with the language of this rather impenetrable English that the statute was written in. Well, the district judge uh, uh, out in a western city, out in, in, in western Massachusetts, a fellow named Michael Ponser, a very bright guy, he pondered this for a while. And uh, he denied our motion to dismiss, and I think it was largely because he was himself quite confused by all of this. But then something happened. Out in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, out on the West Coast, uh, a, the Ninth Circuit uh, ruled in another case brought under the wiretap statute that um, uh, if the... Uh, uh, if the message was stopped temporarily, it was not in copied, it was not a violation of the statute. I won't go into all the details of that because we'll just get mired, but I will tell you this. This was a suit between two private parties in the Ninth Circuit. The U.S. Department of Justice filed an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief in that case, in which it gave an interpretation of the statute that was the same as the one we were relying on in Boston. In other words, they, out in the West Coast, the Department of Justice took our position, even though here they took the opposite position. Why did this happen? Uh, the reason it happened was they were getting very nervous that the interpretation of the statute that was being urged in the West Coast, a case called CONOP, K-O-N-O-P, and it's in the index of my book, that that could be used against FBI agents who were wiretapping uh, without correct authorization in the, this was after the, you know, 9-11 terrorist attacks. They were suddenly getting nervous that they were going to get FBI agents indicted, so they conveniently interpreted the statute differently out there, not realizing that the Department of Justice here took an opposite position because they wanted to get Brad Councilman. It's almost common, if it wasn't so serious and didn't involve the wreckage of so many lives, you would say this was a Gilbert and Sullivan opera that the Department of Justice was involved in uh, with equal parts of idiocy and hypocrisy. Well, uh, Judge Ponser read the Ninth Circuit opinion, he read the amicus brief filed by the Department of Justice, and he reversed himself and he dismissed the indictment against Brad Councilman. But the circus really only was getting started with this little uh, scenario. Because when uh, Ponser dismissed the indictment, the department appealed to the Court of Appeals for the First Circuit here in Boston. And um, the panel that heard the case voted two to one to reverse. That is to say, they agreed with our interpretation that what our client did did not fall within the technical description in the wiretap statute. The government went absolutely berserk and they asked the full panel, the full membership of the First Circuit, uh, from which the three judge panel had been drawn, to review what the panel had done. They reviewed it and they reversed the panel. Uh, now, in the course of the opinion, the Court of Appeals had the nerve, had the nerve, the chutzpah, to say that the statute was clear. Here's a statute that Judge Ponzer didn't understand. The statute that the government had taken opposing positions in the Ninth Circuit and the First Circuit, um, a statute that a, the judge dismissed, the district judge dismissed, a statute that two out of three members of the original First Circuit panel had uh, uh, interpreted the way we interpreted it, and the entire membership of the First Circuit reversed the panel by saying that the statute was clear. Now, you can't make this stuff up. It's right out of the Humpty Dumpty. You just can't make it up. It would happen nowhere outside of government, I think, in this society. Uh, and yet, uh, the austere Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, the court right under the U.S. Supreme Court, actually went through this ridiculous charade. And uh, you can read about it. Uh, 
can read about the opinion on page 262 and 263 of my book. The case never went to the U.S. Supreme Court. The reason was when we got to the jury, the jury, much wiser than the Court of Appeals, acquitted councilmen, even though they were instructed that the government's interpretation of the statute was the correct interpretation. So they managed to broom the case out, and uh, we'll never know how that controversy might have ended if it had gotten to the Supreme Court. Now, I'm going to talk about another uh, aspect, just to give you an idea of uh, how uh, the context in which technical people can get caught up in these nightmares. There's a question. Yeah. So I understand about Milton, why it was prosecuted. Why was this last case The question is that you understood that the motive for prosecuting um, uh, Milken. You want to know what the pro what the motive was for prosecuting this rather nondescript fellow. I, and I love the guy, but he certainly was no Michael Milken in terms of uh, high profile. Um, and the answer is you would have to ask the prosecutor psychiatrist that question. <laughs> I could not figure out. Uh, there are a lot of motives for prosecuting uh, uh, innocent people. One of them is career development. I think that there was some aspect here of you know, the government was getting very nervous about all the people who were able, because of technological innovation, to, to spy on various people, including, I suppose, the government. And they wanted the wiretap statutes strictly interpreted until, as I say, the department out of the West Coast, with no coordination, uh, had a different agenda. They did not want an interpretation that would ensnare FBI agents who were wiretapping without a court order. Uh, and so you had different, you had different uh, motives because you had different little power centers within the government. I've never said the government's well organized and speaks with a single voice. It, it isn't. If it did, we'd really be in trouble. Um, one of the things that in a democracy like ours that helps preserve liberty is the incompetence of the government. You know, thank God for that. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the case of Professor Alfred Zaya because it has an MIT component to it, and I thought that you would get a kick out of that. Uh, professor Zaya. Um, was a physics professor in East Germany, old East Germany when it was a communist state, and uh, he had been invited to attend a vacuum physics conference uh, here at, at MIT. And um, uh, he was arrested, they were waiting for him. They knew that he registered for the conference, they were waiting for him, when his plane landed, they arrested him at Logan Airport, and he was charged with espionage. Uh, now, what did he do to be uh, charged with espionage? Well, he, uh, one semester a year, uh, he was on loan from East Germany to Mexico, where he, where he taught physics at the university at Puebla, Mexico. And uh, while he was teaching his physics course at Puebla, he was approached by East Germans from in, in, from the embassy in Mexico, he asked him to explain to the uh, uh, to, to, to the uh, uh, embassy the meaning of certain documents that the East German embassy in Washington had purchased from a guy who was peddling these documents, who was working in defense industries. Now these documents were, were, were uh, the plans and specifications for sonar, submarine, sonar technology. And uh, they asked Zaya to explain to them what these plans were, and Zaya explained them. Sort of the same as if I'm sure the US government came to MIT and wanted somebody from one of your technical departments to explain to them the meaning of some some uh, uh, plans or specifications that they had gotten, uh, however they had gotten them, and well, most faculty members would, uh, would would help out the government. I know when I was an undergraduate at Princeton, the CIA had 
very tight ties to Princeton, would always be coming by asking faculty members, especially in the physics department, you know, this or that. Uh, and um, not unusual then, not unusual now. Uh, yet Zaya got arrested and charged with espionage for uh, helping out his government in this seemingly innocuous uh, uh, undertaking where they asked him some questions about these documents and he answered them. Now, let me tell you something about the documents. Uh, I decided that, that I was going to consult with experts to find out whether these documents really were properly classified. And here's what we learned. First of all, the documents were selected by the FBI to be used as bait to entrap Zaya. Now, what does that tell you? It obviously tells you that the documents could not have been necessary to the defense of the United States. They would never, even the FBI, would never select documents that actually could be used against this country and sell them to the East Germans. They selected documents that were 20 years obsolete, no longer used in any submarine in the American fleet. They were useless. Naturally, they were still classified, and they probably will be classified until the end of the earth, but they were useless. And the government chose them as bait. So I wanted to see them because I wanted to hire an expert witness to explain to me what this was all about. This isn't my field, as you could well understand. And uh, uh, the government objected to my looking at the documents because they didn't have a security clearance. So I get up and I say to the judge, and by the way, the judge was a terrific guy, a guy I worked for while I was a law student, Judge David Nelson. I said, Judge, uh, let me see if I have this straight. I am an American citizen, unlike Obama, I actually at the time I showed my passport. I am an American citizen. I was born in this country. I have no criminal record. I graduated law school and I got into the bar. And I am asking to see these and I am told that I can't see them because I don't have a security clearance. The same people who were telling me I can't see the documents because I don't have a security clearance sold them to the East German Communist government, <laughs> in whose hands they still repose. Why do I need a security clearance? And the government said, because it's in the regulations. And the judge said, it's in the regulations. You need a security clearance before you look at them. I absolutely refused to get a security clearance and was prepared to try the case without ever seeing the documents that were at the center of the case because I didn't want to play into the government's little game that these documents sold to these Germans really damaged the security interests of the United States. It was utter nonsense. Uh, well, anyway, we never really got the opportunity to play out this trial because and that's a long story, which I won't again go into, but which is explained in the book. Zaya decided to defect. There was a whole circus around the defection. The government gave him a polygraph, claimed he lied on the polygraph, uh, withdrew its offer for him to uh, defect. And in the end, they traded him for Anatoly Sharansky, him and about a dozen other um, trade bait that they had been accumulating in American federal prisons uh, and raising a bitter kind of bitter uh, taste in my mouth that the reason they set him up in this re whole ridiculous scenario was because they were collecting people to trade, used to trade for Sharansky. Sharansky was a very high profile Jewish refusenik Soviet the center uh, who was a pet of the American uh, State Department. They really wanted to get Sharansky released. Uh, the Israeli government really wanted to get Sharansky released. And um, the, uh, the, the Americans were collecting trade bait. When they finally got enough people uh, in American prisons, the Soviets decided it, it was time to let Sharansky go to get back their various their people, which included some spies and some perfectly innocent people like Professor Alfred Zayer. Uh, 
The reason I tell that story, and by the way, if you want a, a, a completely independent view of it, lest you think that I'm uh, resorting to hyperbole, which believe me, uh, I sometimes do, but I'm not now, uh, you can read Craig Whitney, W-H-I-T-N-E-Y, the former uh, European uh, uh, <coughs> uh, reporter uh, uh, for the uh, New York Times, uh, he was the diplomatic reporter for many years uh, throughout the Cold War. Uh, he wrote a book called Spy Trader. It's a very interesting read, uh, and he tells the story of, of the Zaya case from a slightly different perspective uh, than, than mine. I'm going to talk about one more case and then open up to questions. And the reason I want to talk about this final case it's a case of United States versus Walter Lachman, L-A-C-H-M-A-M. Uh, uh, it's because Lachman was in the defense industry. Now, there's another uh, uh, industry that a lot of MIT people are, uh, end up involved in. And uh, they, he, he ran a company called Fiber Materials. And they um, uh, manufactured control panels for certain kinds of uh, equipment that had dual uses. They were used in the defense industry, they were used in private industry. And uh, there was a device known as a hot isostatic press. Some of you probably know what I'm talking about more than I do, although I did have to study about so-called HIPs, HIPs, uh, in this case. They harden materials. So you can, you, they, they, you, you, you put materials in these uh, devices and they harden them, they use them as missile nose cones and so forth, they become heat resistant. And uh, Walter Lockman's company made control panels for these uh, uh, hot isostatic press devices. And there were two types of hips. There were the large ones which were controlled. You, they were export controls. You couldn't send them out to another country unless you had government agency permission. Uh, and then there were smaller uh, hips, and those were not controlled. The problem, Walter's life fell apart for the following reason. He manufactured a control panel that controlled both the large export control hip and the small not controlled hip. In other words, Walter's control panels were dual use, okay? Trust me, nobody could figure out the application of these regulations to a dual use device. And to prove it, the Department of Commerce, Department of Justice, and Department of Defense took the position in Walter's trial that it was obvious from the regulations that the regulations required an export license in order to ex export a dual-use panel that could be, could be used, among other uses, for a large hip that was a controlled device. And they convinced the judge, the trial judge, a very bright guy, by the way, uh, that they were right. Their interpretation was right. And they went to trial, and Walter was convicted. And after conviction, but before sentencing, he hired us, because <coughs> he couldn't believe, he thought he was a sophisticated businessman, he couldn't believe that his reading of the regulation wasn't at least as good as some idiot from the Department of Commerce who was claiming he was a felon. So we look at them and we say, you know, Walter might be right, the government might be right. The fact is, no human being can understand this regulation. This is ridiculous. Uh, but we can make as good an argument that Walter was right and that the Commerce Department was right. So we, we're investigating. Mind you, he hasn't been sentenced yet. We're investigating. And suddenly we discover, and I won't tell you how we discovered it, but, I, but we discovered that NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, interpreted which, of course, coordinated with the U.S. Department of Commerce and the U.S. Department of Defense on these issues, NATO interpreted the regulation like we did. And the Americans in, at NATO 
in Belgium interpreted it as we did. It was only the prosecutors and the prosecutors team here that interpreted differently. A situation very much like the one I told you about earlier with Brad Councilman and the interpretation of the wiretap statute. You have the government, two different branches of the same government, with two different interpretations, and virtually proving that either one of them was tenable, and yet they're prepared to put Walter away for decades. You know, this is, man, it's dangerous to the national defense, blah, 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 blah. They were willing to put him away for decades because his interpretation was the same as theirs was abroad, uh, the Department of Defense. So we show this to the judge. The judge looks at it and says, wow. And he vacates the jury's verdict. He says, we can't convict this guy where the government's own you know, uh, experts say that he interpreted this correctly. So vacates the conviction. The government appeals, the Court of Appeals. And the Court of Appeals reverses and says, oh, it's clear to us Mind you, these judges, well, what have they been through law school? Big deal. The judges say it's clear to them. Whereas to the government, it was, you could go either way. And they were prepared to put Walter in prison for years because they claim that it was clear. This is the Court of Appeals. And, um, uh, one of the judges wrote a precious dissent saying that, uh, uh, well, let, let me just tell you, the Court of Appeals said, oh, this isn't really constitutionally, uh, constitutional vagueness. This is garden variety vagueness. What the hell is garden variety vagueness? And one of the judges who dissented said, you know, if this is garden variety vagueness, this is a garden in need of a weed killer. And so the Court of Appeals was split, and yet they were prepared to send Walter to prison. The judge realized the situation and was wiser than the Court of Appeals and wiser than the prosecutors, and he gave Walter a probationary sentence, uh, and that ended the case. But um, uh, I have given you a sort of cross-section of some of the cases in which these uh, idiotic interpretations of statutes have threatened to put citizens, innocent citizens, in prison for years or decades. And I've given you cases in which some of them we won and some of them we lost. The ones we lost, uh, we managed to keep people out of prison. But I can tell you that an enormous number of these cases end up in plea bargains where people plead guilty to get five-year sentences instead of going to trial, being convicted, and getting 20-year sentences. And so there are an awful lot of innocent people caught up in this nightmare that has been generated since the mid-1980s by a proliferation of federal criminal statutes that no thinking person can understand or interpret, where even courts disagree, and we're on the very same panel as, as in the Lachman case, is the, 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 the First Circuit was split. The majority had the nerve to say that this is the, you know, this is absolutely clear. Any vagueness is garden variety, whatever the hell garden variety is. And uh, it is a problem in, in, in need of radical reform. There is some hope. Uh, this is a problem that now the left and the right and all sectors of civil society in this country are starting to recognize. There is now a working group composed of representatives of the Heritage Society, which is the very conservative, pro-business, uh, you know, it's headed by Ed Meese, former Attorney General under Ronald Reagan, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and the ACLU, two groups that are, were called by Meese when he was Attorney General, the criminal, Criminals Lobby. I always remind him of that every time I, I, I'm down in Washington and I give a talk at the Heritage Foundation that I'm, I'm from the Criminals Lobby. Uh, representative of the criminal's lobby. Um, but he's seen the light. Um, and uh, 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 the uh, libertarian groups have been on to this for years. The Reason Foundation in California and, uh, and Cato Institute in Washington. All these groups have aligned in order to try to get reform from the Congress.
to alleviate this problem. I think they realize their chances of getting relief from the Department of Justice are nil, because the department loves vague language. It means they can go after anybody in this room for any reason. They could find some crime committed that will manage to get by some bobble-headed federal judge. And so it's, um, there's a battle going on in Washington over this. It's a civil liberties battle. It's one of the premier civil liberties that, as well as, you know, the, the whole war on terror business is one of the premier civil liberties battles of the era. And it's, it's ill-recognized, you know, it's ill-recognized. And it affects all, all, all across the board. It affects society across the board. Businessmen, yes, businessmen aren't always the most sympathetic characters when you, you know, uh, the newspapers uh, don't seem to like businessmen, a lot of them, except for the Wall Street Journal. But it actually affects, if you read my book, you'll see that there are uh, professors who are indicted, there are artists who have been indicted, physicians have a terrible time uh, because the government second guesses they're prescribing painkillers and a lot of them are indicted for violating their narcotics laws when all they're trying to do is to keep their uh, patients from being in intense, intractable pain. And you go on and on throughout the entire civil society, and you see that everybody is being harassed in, uh, in the same fashion uh, as, as any of you in this room might be. Uh, and so uh, now you're going to ask me, and this, this is the end of my talk. I know I've gone over time. We want time for Q&A. Uh, you're going to say, how do we protect ourselves from from this. Well, of course, one thing to do is to join the uh, bandwagon that's uh, looking to, to get, bring this to the attention of Congress. And they've had some, they've had some success. Uh, I testified last year uh, before the House uh, Subcommittee on Crime uh, uh, with regard to a new proposed statute uh, against cyberbullying, the idea was that if you bullied somebody by using uh, the facilities of interstate communications, because that's federal jurisdiction comes in through the interstate aspect, and of course that means if you did it on the telephone, if you did it on email, uh, you would be guilty of a federal felony. And you look at the definition of bullying, and you are aghast. My testimony. We beat, the, we beat this, by the way, um, and uh, uh, I, I think my testimony was probably very effective. I got up there and I said to the members of the subcommittee, gentlemen, um, you know that what you are looking to make a crime is something that I do every day, and I do it as part of my work. My job is to bully certain people and get them to back off. That's my job. And I use the telephone, and I use email. And you're telling me that now my job is being made into a felony. And guess whose else job involves cyberbullying? Yours. You're trying to get somebody to vote your way. You're trying to get somebody uh, to uh, join your cause or, or quit the other person's cause. Uh, you're engaging in what I read in the definition. I said that's cyberbullying. And so, you know, are you really interested in putting me and you out of business? And the bill went nowhere. They really realized the insanity of, of, um, of these statutes. And they come up, you know, hundreds of them a year. Um, they, they, they go before the Congress. And some of them get enacted. Um, now, what can you do to protect yourself? Well, one thing I can tell you never to do when you're involved in business, never delete anything because it will be called an obstruction of justice. There will be a claim. If there's ever an investigation into anything you've done, the first thing they will see is if they can find deleted emails. And you don't want to delete anything. You want to store stuff. Uh, that goes you know, counter. We're Americans, right? We believe in privacy. However, uh, maintaining privacy by deleting stuff is, is quite dangerous. When you are doing something that's unprecedented, that's new, that's cutting edge, do memos to the file about what you're doing. Record your current intentions and understandings. Because if they're ever questioned, um, you want to be able to show what was contemporaneously on your mind uh, at the time. Um, and um, 
uh, use care uh, in whom you uh, talk uh, to, about your work. Um, be careful not to disclose protected uh, uh, secrets to people who might use the information to sell to competitors or to trade uh, securities on Wall Street. There's a trial just gone to the jury now that indicates the, uh, the importance of not talking uh, about certain things that you're doing if they're uh, a cutting edge or intellectual property. Um, and be careful any time you do trade in securities, uh, which might be affected by any work you do. Get, a, get a advice of the company's legal counsel before you buy or sell uh, such securities, or advise anyone else to buy or sell. Um, if you're ever approached or called, visited by a government investigator, say absolutely nothing and call your lawyer right away. You are still American citizens. You have a right not to say anything. Don't say anything. If you do give an interview, record it. Record it. Because it will not be reported accurately by a government investigator. Trust me on that. As a matter of fact, if you're visited by an FBI agent and you insist on recording the interview, the FBI agents will leave. You know there's a regulation that prohibits an FBI agent from conducting an interview of either a suspect or a witness if there's a tape recorder going. They do not want an accurate record of what you say. Instead, what they do is they bring, you know, what's the reason you have two FBI agents visit you, never one? The reason is one questions you and the other one takes notes. The one who takes notes goes back and types up a version of the interview. That becomes the government's official version. And you don't have a recording to prove that you said otherwise. Well, thank you for showing up. It's been a long time.